We are now starting our meeting for Wednesday, June 26th, and I'm asking for any public comments. <laughs> okay, <laughs> don't see anybody. No, <laughs> we will know. We will now go into closed session to discuss. 2.1 Certificated Public Employee Appointment, Government Code Section 54957, Classified Public Employee Appointment, Appointment Employment, 54957, 2.3 Negotiations Update, 2.4 Public Employee Discipline Dismissal Release, 2.5 Final Ag Settlement Agreement and Release for one special education student. Okay, hello. <laughs> we are starting our meeting this Wednesday, June 26th. And um, we're going to do the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, bueno, no creo que... Que si, si los que necesiten que ella, Virginia, traduce para ustedes, se puede pedir... Oh, Eva. Oh, perdón. Un error. Este, lo siento. <laughs> I'm very sorry. I made a mistake. <laughs> okay. <laughs> se, se puede conseguir los aparatos con ella, ¿verdad? <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. I'm going to have first... Superintendent Dr. Rodriguez, give her comments. Yeah, so thank you. So we're proud of the work that we've been doing around um, building foundational literacy for our students. So um, we sent this out just a few days ago. We began our SIPs um, pilot in 2017 with just three schools. And this past year, we increased our impact to nine schools, affecting 2,467 students and 102 teachers. Um, and next year, we'll add the last seven sc schools so that all 16 schools have the SIPs program. So estamos muy, muy orgullosos de trabajo que hemos estado haciendo para, para promover la lectura fundamental de nuestros estudiantes. So comenzamos el piloto de SIPs en 2017 um, um, con solo tres escuelas y este año pasado estamos impactando a nueve escuelas. Um, este es beneficio para 2,477 estudiantes y um, 102 maestras. El próximo año um, vamos a agregar las últimas siete escuelas para que todas las 16 escuelas um, tienen el programa de SIPs. Um, so if you look in the middle of the graph, what you'll see is um, our incredible growth on the first grade students. Um, so they went from indi reading independently, so that's something that's very important, reading independently from 47, uh, 48% um, to 89%. Um, wow. And we saw the significant growth as they moved to second grade as well. So nuestros estudiantes que pueden ver en el medio de la página de primer grado están haciendo un crecimiento increíble. Puede ver que el número de estudiantes de primer grado que leen de forma independiente está mejorando, empezando con 48% y llegó a 89%. Y también vemos ese crecimiento significante en segundo grado también. So at the bottom of the slide, you will see 
um, the second great success. So if you look um, at the far left, you see Amesti. Amesti has been in the program two years, and you will see that they started out at the 34th percentile, then the first year of SIPs, they went to the 57th percentile, and now um, the 67th percentile. And then you look at three of our brand new schools, and you see their past two years, and then their first year of SIPs and you'll see the great growth um, that has happened with their second grade students. So allí puede ver el éxito que están haciendo el segundo grado allí al final de la gráfica. Puede ver la escuela de MESTI que han tenido el programa por dos años, que empezó con 44, llegó el primer año del programa a 57, segundo año a um, 67, y después puede ver las tres escuelas um, que, son, es que están en su primer año de este programa y el progreso que han, que han hecho. Um, and so we're just really proud of the work that we're doing. Um, we'll continue um, to speak to our success um, with SBAC scores um, once um, we can publicly speak to them. So estamos muy orgullosos del progreso que estamos haciendo. Vamos a hablar de los resultados de SBAC cuando ya es posible. So thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> I just want to say really quickly, um, if you want to speak on an item, um, get one of those little, they're probably yellow, little cards, and um, yes, and give them to Eva. Si quieren hablar en un lugar en la agenda, hay que agarrar las tarjetitas y darlos a Eva para poder hablar. <coughs> okay, now, now for board comments. We can start at the end again with Jennifer. Good evening, everyone. It's been a busy a month of June. Um, I have met with the intergovernmental committee with our city, and we're discussing the safety of our children. We know that there's a lot of crosswalks that need work. And it's in work, it's in work. They are listening and they're getting that done. Um, we are talking about utilizing the police department more to help us with certain issues. Um, Dr. Rodriguez has reached out, and I know Joe's reached out also to the chief of police, and we're getting some things in place, and hopefully they'll be helping us with the situation with Navigator come August. So traffic will be moving smoothly, hopefully. Um, went to a meeting with our assemblyman Robert Rivas, um, with Jennifer Holm and Danny Dodge. We talked about the importance of SELPA um, funding and asked him to help us, basically, and get some ed more education funding coming our way and put it in everybody's ear that the districts need money in order to take care of their children properly. Trustee uh, Shocker really summed up those two meetings nicely. I just want to add for traffic safety around um, schools, one of the things that we discussed in the intergovernmental committee meeting was that there are avenues, for if you have an ongoing concern that you know you can, in, within the city of Watsonville, you know, you can call the, the traffic reporting line for Watsonville PD, but outside of the city of Watsonville, you can contact the Aptos branch of the CHP, and I spoke with them, and they were very, they're like, yep, call us, let us know of any ongoing issues. Nothing to report. <laughs> Welcome to the meeting, everybody. Um, recently attended um, a board meeting of Pajaro Valley Prevention Services, and we'll have a nice report, I think, tonight um, on their activity. Um, I'm very impressed with the building that they're constructing on East Lake. I'm uh, very proud to be. Um, associated with the organization and proud of the work that they're doing to help our community. Um, and then just on the political front, we're all missing the debates tonight, so I hope everybody's <laughs> taping them. But um, just a word about how sad and disgusted I am with what's going on at the border with the children that have been separated and were housed. And I'm just wondering um, if maybe we could reach out some way and find out if there's any need for foster homes for these kids. Um, in our county because um, tiny children should not be separated from loving adults and um, 
and I don't know where HHS is housing these kids, but um, there's just apparently not enough places for them. So I'm, I am curious if, if our community can help out with any of those kids who need love. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Glad that to see everybody's here. A um, couple things I'd like to say. Thank you, Michelle and Joe, whoever got E.A. Hall, um, re redid the asphalt. Uh, I've been reaching out to the city about trying to put a flashing light on Brennan in California because everybody knows Callahan Park is busy all year round. Um, some more programs, food programs, uh, just a lot of things. I went to the Watsonville City Council meeting last night with Michelle and uh, Joe where we talked about how we wanted the city council to approve the permit so we could construct the auditorium at PV and they went through with that so hopefully we can get that started. Um, also attended a Robert Rivas event with other trustees where they talked about the SELPA and assembly member Robert Rivas and invited us to check out Hollister High School because he says they have a um, a great cell phone program, so we're looking forward to taking a visit over there. Um, when I was at the Watsonville City Council meeting last night, I saw Chief Honda, and I said thank you for releasing that statement saying that Watsonville PD would not be in participating in ICE deportations. Um, it's you know it's a scary time. Uh, you know, as Trustee DeSerpa was saying, it's a scary time. A lot of people in our districts um, are afraid. Um, uh, also, too, just when Mr. Serpa said that uh, before I was uh, elected, I, when children were first being separated at the border, um, I was part of a demonstration in San Diego and San Ysidro because this has been happening for a while. And a lot of the pictures that we've been seeing, it's, it's been happening a long time. And uh, children don't belong in prisons. Um, children should be separated from their parents. So thank you very much. I wonder if we should do some kind of a resolution against what's been going on because, I mean, they're talking about that children are really under what they call torture because um, they're sleeping on concrete floors, no beds, and um, they, they're not allowed any, basically, practically no water, no toothbrushes, no soap, and they can't clean their baby's bottles. I mean, it's just like, and there's bright lights all night long, they have to sleep in, with bright lights on the whole night long, and there's barely any food for them to eat. So, it's it's kind of like torture for the children there um, on the border. And so, I don't know if what we could do, put a resolution out there to, um, you know, somehow that to our administration or someplace. I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, I'm sure Panetta's would be understanding about it, but whatever. Yeah, it's difficult. Um, so the only committee I go to all summer long, I go to this committee all summer long, is the Migrant Head Start, because obviously migrants are working in the summer, obviously. And um, so that's a committee meeting that I go to all summer. I just went to the last one, and it was our last executive policy committee meeting, and the next meetings are going to be very big, huge meetings with at least 30 to 40 um, participants in them in the boardroom here. Um, so from 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 July on to November, when you know when the their program is going to kind of close, um, there'll be big meetings. So I'm looking forward to those too. All right, thank you. going to approve the agenda. Um, <coughs> I'm requesting to amend the agenda to remove item six, because it's, uh, it's not correct about the public hearing. So I'm requesting to, yeah, with the amendment of removing. Okay. Oh, you done a second? Oh, okay, I didn't know. Okay, I know I didn't hear you said the second. <laughs> Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. <coughs> the next one is um, 
approval of the minutes five so can I have a motion to approve the mentions for June 12th 2009 I'll make a motion to approve a second all those in favor aye, aye. and this is this is 601 Thank you. 601 <laughs> okay um, now we're on how did it go from five to seven? Oh, because six. Right? Okay, six is gone. I get <laughs> it. Seven, visitor non-agenda items. Two minutes each. So first off, we have Erica Anderson. Thank you. My name is Erica Anderson, and I'm the Program and Development Manager with the Santa Cruz County Animal Shelter. And we have our shelter in Santa Cruz, and we also have our shelter here in Watsonville, right down the street. And uh, part of my initiative coming into the shelter is to reach more out into um, the Watsonville community, and specifically focusing on humane education programs in the classroom. So I just wanted to come here and announce that we will be offering free tailored presentations for um, classrooms in Pajaro Valley. Thank All you. All right, thank you. <coughs> Before you sit down, can I ask one question? Um, so we have a lot of um, families that might have a dog that needs to be spayed or neutered. Are there, can you just say like yes. a tiny bit? Because this goes out on um, community TV, so lots of people will hear your voice. So if okay. you could just give a teeny tiny two yeah, sentences. Definitely. So the Santa Cruz County Animal Shelter is the only open admission shelter in the county. Um, so we are not connected to the SPCA. They focus on humane education and different programs like that where we focus more on spay and neuter and outreach programs like that. So we actually um, have a program called Healthy Pets for All. And that program offers free vaccines, uh, different um, pet items like food, or toys or dog beds, whatever they might need, all for free. Um, we actually just had one in downtown Santa Cruz last week and we served 86 animals for free. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> it was a lot of animals. Yeah, a lot of animals. It was a long day, <laughs> it was a long day, <laughs> but it was amazing. It was, <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> it was amazing. Um, and we do offer, uh, we have a planned pet hood program and people can go to our website, www.scanimalshelter.org to learn more about those programs. Um, we do offer a variety of assistance ranging from um, the community's needs as far as spay and neuter programs go. Um, and we encourage you to spay and neuter and microchip your pets. So, so there's yeah. not gonna be an event like that in Watsonville anytime soon, like uh, the Santa Cruz event. I'm working on a Watsonville one coming up hopefully in September, waiting okay. to get the date approved. And okay. it will be at the um, spay and neuter clinic. Can't think of that. But it That's will be okay. coming. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, next, we have Laura Zucker. Hello. I wasn't good evening, everyone. I wasn't planning to say anything for once. <clears throat> but thank you. Uh, very funny. Thank you, uh, <laughs> Trustee the Serpa and Danny and everyone else for talking about um, the issue of the detention camps at Me the too. border. I, I did it too. I did too, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Karen, is Kate? Yeah, no, I expect you to talk about that. So it's, anyway, I was really glad you all brought it up. Um, just two things, and I hope I have the date right, but I was trying to look at my email. If you did want to, uh, if anyone did want to um, attend something about helping folks understand their rights, because there's supposed to be ICE raids this weekend, the Community Action Board and Sanctuary Santa Cruz, I got an email I think from Sanctuary Santa Cruz is having a training, which I'm going to, I believe it's this Saturday, I'm almost sure, the 29th from one to four, it'll be at the Cabrillo College Watsonville building over there in Union Street. Um, but I would look at, I would contact the Community Action Board, right? We all know what that is, right? And uh, so everyone will be trained, so it's for families, it's for folks to find out what to do if ICE comes to your door, and it's also to train those of us who want to be part of the rapid response um, network, which I have not joined, but you then are called if someone needs to witness what's, if you to come as a witness or to come as a whatever um, with 
the knowledge that we have about the process so you the people who are um, experiencing a raid have allies there to film or to somehow support. That's the Y A R R is the, you think I would know what this means, but something, something, rapid response. Anyway, you can get trained to do that. So that's on this Saturday. The other thing is on Friday the 5th, just after the 4th of July, if you're in Santa Cruz, and I live above Santa Cruz, we, m friends of I, <laughs> mine and me and my family and other families and teachers and other folks in the community, we have a uh, Friday vigil um, from 5 to 6, which is a justice at the border vigil at the town clock in Santa Cruz. For those of you who have been at the university or know Santa Cruz, that's where demonstrations are held, is at the town clock, right? Mm -hmm. So 5 to 6, we hold our signs, we get people to sign a petition so we can get more signatures to send to our uh, legislatures, and it's, it's good. People honk, and we figure we get it out there a little bit more and a little bit more, that we are against um, this really cruel, uh, unacceptable use of concentration camps at our border. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, I was going to ask you one more question. <laughs> yes. So how do you, because I don't know if I can come this weekend. I actually yeah, work yeah. on the weekends, believe it or not. Um, how could I be involved to do the rapid response by, because calling cab or what could no, I do? No, yeah, I would say call cab and see what is, what is the What training. I need to do. Yeah, what is the training? Okay. And I know the organizations, or Google Y-A-R-R, -R, okay. that if anyone knows, it's something, <laughs> Y-A, rapid response, I don't happen to know, or Sanctuary Santa Cruz, there's various groups, but yeah, it's been around for a while actually. Okay, because okay. I'd like to be Good. involved in that, but I, c I don't think I can come in the weekend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, I have to work. Okay, well, thank <laughs> you, guys. Thank yeah, you. thanks. And then just a comment to follow up on that. Um, as a district, are we sending any special messaging out to families? Um, like, no, you rise. I know that there's, um, you know, different groups out there that have um, postcards, that have a sort of flyer that explains what they can do if eyes were to show up on their um, yeah, I doorstep and yes. so forth. So I think it's it's good if we as a district send out something, um, especially yeah. with what's yeah. going on and everything that we're seeing right now. So we, we were the first, I want to remind the board that we were the first district to do a resolution in right. support of um, enforcement of immigration, meaning that no um, organization can actually come on our campus without going through my office. Um, so we do have that. We also in PVPSA may be able to speak a little bit when they come up. We were the first, one of the first agencies with the Community Action Board to do um, the the workshops with the parents and we do hand out the red cards. Yeah, we so we definitely can do another effort um, before Friday, um, before the, the weekend um, for people. Um, but it is also on our website um, and, but we'll, we'll do a, a, an extra push. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be super great. <coughs> okay, you're done. Um, so employee organization comments, I know there's a lot of people from PVFT, are you, are you not gonna come? Oh, good, because you know, cause I know there's people gone, a lot of people are gone. Yes. Good for you, <laughs> thank you. So don't, um, I'm gonna read off the thing so I don't miss my comments. Um, good evening, Board of Trustees and Dr. Rodriguez. So first of all, um, I'm Radhika Kirkman and I am coming in to PVFT as the new grievance officer for the upcoming school year. So um, I would just like to introduce myself, um, but I also wanna express that um, as a new officer, um, uh, PVFT is still committed to always follow our state, federal, and contractual processes. So we ensure members' compensation, working conditions, and due process are always optimal and followed by the district at all times. So that will be my job and I intend to ensure that that happens. Um, I also want to give a few comments from our president-elect. So we would like to look forward to continuing our negotiations as soon as possible to avoid the unnecessary complications of retroactive pay. We know how complicated that is for both employees and the district. Um, so we look forward to after July coming back in ready to negotiate at the table. Um, also, PVFT would just like to say that we um, look forward to continuing our work that we started last year with the Labor Management Initiative. Um, and we want to continue solidifying dates, meetings, goals, and actions so that we can continue working together as a team. 
Um, and lastly, I just want to say I look forward to getting to know each and one of you uh, better in my position with regular meetings and um, working together as a team to ensure we're meeting our needs. So thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, CSEA. I don't see anybody here from CSEA. Um, Pavam, does anybody want from the Association of Managers want to get up here? I don't see anyone. Okay. And then lastly, 8.4 is Communication Workers of America, which I've never ever seen once. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, now I'm on number nine, action items. Um, we're going to do what we've already done last time. We went over the whole local control accountability plan, and so this is the sort of action item, and people can make comments if they want, but we last week was the week, I mean, last board meeting was the time to do it, hopefully. But um, so presentation is going to be by Susan Perez still, I guess. Yes, thank you, President um, Osmondson, uh, members of the board, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, actually, my presentation is quite brief. Mm -hmm. um, we brought the LCAP forward um, at the last meeting on the 12th, had an opportunity for public hearing. Um, there were not requests from the board to make modifications to the LCAP, so it is coming forward this evening for your final approval. All right, so is there any discussion? Is there any discussion from the board? No, there, no I, mean, I know we don't have the public speakers. Yeah. <laughs> no? I'd like to move for approval. Okay. A second. All right, all those in favor of the LCAP? Aye. Aye. 601. <clears throat> and now the next one is for the 2019-2020 July budget adoption. And that report was also part of a public hearing where we listened to Joe give us a complete outline of our budget. There's no public speakers. Oh, there is a public speaker. Good evening, uh, Madam President, uh, Dr. Rodriguez, uh, trustees, staff, patients. Okay, I made some comments at the last meeting. Uh, after looking at it some more, I have some additional comments. I have some major concerns that I wanted to go over with you. First of all, the, the rep, other revenue drops off $7 million with no explanation. 3% layoff of certificated. 1.6% layoff of classified. Healthcare rises to 19% of spending. And you know what I said last time, where the hell is the review? So no raises in spite of 3% per year COLA increases. No raises. If there are raises in here, it means you're going to have to cut even more people. So on the other revenue, why does it drop? No explanation. Is it due to lost programs, which is usually how it's explained? But then I would say, what happened to our grant writer? Because aren't they backfilling the stuff that's falling out? should be. On the personnel cuts, it was explained due to reduced enrollment. However, the presentation only shows a 0.3% drop in enrollment. So how do you cut one teacher for each school? Do you drop a class at each school? Because you've got to cut 30-some teachers. On health care, at $49 million, it's 19% of spending. Almost one fifth of what we spend goes into health care. The increase drops to 2% in the following years. Where's the data that backs that up? Everything I've read says it's 6 to 9% per year. 
why haven't we done a review by the board on the effectiveness of our provider? Hello. Here's the slide that was in the presentation, and so I've annotated the 19% spending. Health and welfare, largest part of benefits and getting bigger every year. I think there's a strike potential based on this budget. With a 3% yearly COLA increase, no raises, and a cut in personnel, we are open for a strike. If I were a union member, I wouldn't put up with this budget. An observation. This budget looks like one that has been tops down adjusted in order to get a positive accreditation. Uh, I've seen that in business and you go, it's not acceptable. And I don't think the employees will stand by and do nothing. So thank you for your time. I would say, do you have questions? And I say that in a humorous way because you know you aren't allowed to. But I can do clarifications on any of the data that I've presented. So if you need clarifications, I'm here. By the way, how many of you believe that there's only going to be 2% increase in health care per year? Geez, no hands. Thank you. Thank you. So, so as required, uh, we, as a district, provided the public hearing, and then uh, on or before July 1st, or um, no later than five days after, we have to submit uh, our adopted budget if the board or district approves in alignment with our LCAP and our resources as a district. And as previously uh, mentioned uh, in the previous um, uh, agenda item, the, the decrease in revenue is due to the one-time funding. So a reflection of 1819 to 1920, we no longer receive the one-time funding from the state. So the one-time funds drops, and that's approximately $3 million. Um, and then our state grants are reduced about $2 million. Um, and then local grants, one of the things, as I mentioned, it's a, a living budget, a living document. So we don't uh, recognize the grant until we get a grant. And so that's why we don't... Um, state that we're going to receive $5 million if we're not been awarded a grant. So that's not reflective in the budget, nor would we do that. Um, and then the um, reductions uh, in the out years, that's due to declining enrollment. And we mentioned that in the public hearing. Um, and then also, as I mentioned as well, as well is uh, health care is rising, and that's approximately a majority and 19% of our budget, so that's correct. And then I do know that districts that do not belong to a JPA, that their, re their rates have increased more significantly than ours. So we have in a shared pool, we spread that liability with approximately a little bit over 200 districts. Um, so that's the benefit. Um, but overall, that's the uh, summary of the budget that was presented in the public hearing and for tonight for approval. Okay. Okay, well, I... Is there any comments from the board? Okay. Yes. Okay, go ahead. So I know that I mentioned this um, when we talked about budget, and I know some of it's going to be pending negotiations, so we're not going to talk about that. But I know we are trying to reduce our benefit cost um, overall by looking at different initiatives. Um, also, what are we doing to improve our consultant costs? I mean, we spend a lot of money on consultants in our budget. Yeah. So there's um, certain areas that we do not have the internal capacity uh, for a specific scope of work, and there's other areas where we're building capacity. So you'll see some consultant contracts uh, doing scope of work for the district and others being phased out or no longer continuing. Um, but that's both throughout the whole district, both in business operations and the program side um, and if anything like that. So several months ago, we actually looked into that and we were at that point, we had only spent a little under 700,000 for um, consultants. I did, as I mentioned, I did mention that over 300,000 of that was linked to the SIPs implementation, which is um, going to be phased out as we move through our last set of schools. Um, but what I believe I showed you 
inadvertently this um, just a few minutes ago was um, if we can make the impact that we are doing on our first and second grade students, um, it is well worth the $300,000 in coaching and support for our teachers. And so we have to, and I say this saying often, but sometimes we have to invest in order to get the return. And so I think there's a mis, um, a misbelief that we spend a lot on consultants. And in reality, we don't. Um, the majority of the additional programs that we have brought into the district have been through the grant writer. This year alone, she's brought in $6 million worth of funding. 1.2 million just came, or 1.8 million just came to us in the form of electric buses, right? And so we constantly are bringing in additional funding using our grant writer. Um, and so I, I, we have said in the past, we're building capacity to work people out of a job. So whether it's consultants for facilities or consultants for ed services, um, our job is to build the capacity within to then get them to where they're no longer necessary. Um, but we also, and this probably will not be a popular answer, but it is true, if we, would, if we could have done it ourselves, we would have done it prior. And so we could not do the SIPs implementation by ourselves without the outside support of training our teachers, our staff, our coaches. And now we have that and we've proven that by investing, we're making an impact on students, which in the end is the most important. Thank you for your clarification. I think it's important for the public to know about those certain costs and what they actually are doing for our community. My only other concern is, I know we talked about, we had a consultant help us with the average daily attendance in us losing students for next year. I'm just concerned that we may actually move, lose more students with current legislative bills that are in the process right now, and if they do pass, I worry that we're gonna actually have a bigger drop in our student population. So it's something we might wanna take a look at. Okay, any more comments? Can I have a motion? Oh, do you have a motion? In regards to our um, spending on health and welfare benefits, um, I know it's negotiable, but are, what can you can you speak at all to any of the any of the ideas that were are coming forward in order to try to contain those costs? So we have a health and welfare uh, benefits committee that looks at various scenarios. So uh, approximately, I would say, twenty five options were reviewed. Uh, out of the twenty five, three went into further discussion to move forward in negotiations. Um, those include like the current network that we have that where our beneficiaries can go to see a doctor. What does it look like if we narrow down that network? And that cost savings is approximately a certain amount of, of dollars. Uh, the other uh, option that was looked at or is being looked at right now that was similar that was previous looked at is um, the cost of co-pays and then the cost of co-pays for prescription or non-prescription uh, drugs. So that's also an item that's also being reviewed. And then uh, one of the successes that the district uh, did recently was um, having double coverage or dual coverage when your uh, spouse or significant other or your spouse has uh, insurance through another employer. So making sure that we have um, single coverage uh, for, for couples rather than having double coverage from different employers. So that's another item that was successfully done last time around. Um, and then there's other options that are also being reviewed under the Health and Welfare Benefits Committee. But the three that I mentioned are currently part of negotiations right now. And uh, another one that's also being discussed, I forgot to mention this one, is the Health Savings uh, uh, Act, which is uh, HSA. And so it's one of the plans that if we can increase the um, enrollees into that program, there's a cost savings to the district and it's a tax benefit for the employee. Um, I think one of the things that we're looking at in LMI is like a collaborative awareness of, a, of the benefits of a HSA. Um, so that's also being um, taken as part of the initiative. Mm. Sounds good. Thank you. You're welcome. OK. 
Okay, are we ready to vote? <laughs> Motion. I move to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Six zero one. Okay, um, the next one is not something we've already discussed. <laughs> this, well, have we already discussed this one? No. Yeah. Oh, no, no, we haven't. No, Michael's transportation, no. So 9.3, Michael's transportation contract, which is part of SELPA by Heather Gorman. Hi, good evening, President Osmondson, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. I um, wanted to come to just talk about this a little bit because it's something that's new but we've been doing for a while now. We have had a contract indirectly with Michaels Transportation through the Bay School for over 10 years. The Bay School is no longer willing to do the contract within what they're doing so they wanted us to directly have a contract with them. This is really good timing for us in a lot of ways because Katie and our department or in transportation is working on building this um, route herself using either the new white fleet that she is um, purchasing and working on hiring and moving forward with or using a bus to transport the students. She's not quite ready for that yet, so I met with um, Michael's Transportation and renegotiated the contract of how it looks because it was a three-year contract and now it's a year contract with a specific clause in it if you look through it that says that the agreement may be terminated within, um, with or without cause by either party for within 20 days. So we just need to give written notice and we can terminate the contract which is good for us as we build the fleet and then we can take over the contract. Mm -hmm. So um, the specifics of the contract, Bay School runs longer than our schools, so it's for 229 days. It's um, $695 um, dollars per day per bus, and we just, we have the one bus that goes. So. Um, Not as expensive. It is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's, we'll see, I mean, it won't be that we're paying more because we'll see the um, discount from what we're paying the Bay School so it's coming directly off of what they build us from the base school, oh, and good. we're you know paying Michaels directly. Oh, okay, so it's a little bit less too. Oh. It's about it's not it's not a cost savings. It's neutral. I mean, it's, oh, it's neutral. Yeah. Oh, darn it. So, but <laughs> it will be once we get it up and going ourselves. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Hopefully yeah. that. Hurry up and do it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've been talking with Katie about it, and we she has you know all of the information she needs, so she's working on it, and it's just making sure that everything's in place. I have a question for mm -hmm. you, Heather. If there's no public speakers, no, no, okay. Um, so six hundred ninety-five dollars per bus per day. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of money. Yes. Um, so do we pay for the annual like 365 days including summer or do we just pay for we, the days in which our students attend school we pay for the days the students attend school but there are if like they if they don't give notice that they're not going to be going to school or um, like so how they've done it in the past with the bus and the base school they did individually and if a student was off they would not charge for the time the student was off now they're just sending the bus and doing the route so we pay for the days the students are going to the school and when we're when they're not going to school we don't pay for those days okay that's a good Thank thing you. that is a good thing <laughs> a good thing <laughs> uh, yeah go ahead Obviously, this is a good program. Um, what happens? Do we have a plan if, for instance, the buses aren't up and running next year? For transportation? Yes. For, for our buses? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can talk to Katie and get more information okay. about that. But what I've seen in the past at the buses, they, they make it work with whatever bus they have available. And sometimes they have to switch up buses. They've never not picked up our students or transported them well, no. with, no. within. Yeah. Would we have to do this contract again on, for the next school year? Not if we take this yeah. on, yeah. Oh. So if, if we take this on through PBUSD and Katie has that, 
she will, we will not do the contract, we'll terminate the contract. Right. Uh, when I saw this agenda, I was thinking of other ideas. You know, I, I reached out to Community Bridges. I know they do some type of transportation service. Um, I looked into the metro just to see what we can do. But thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right, this is an action item still. So we need a first and a second motion. Motion to approve this contract with Michael's transportation. And we hope we, it's not very long. <laughs> I'll second. <laughs> all right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. 601. Five. five. I mean, 502. Oh, she's gone. Well, I didn't catch that. <laughs> okay, um, so 9.4 is approved program facilities and services agreement between PBUSD and Pottle Valley prevention and student assistance <laughs> presented by Michelle Rodriguez but also I would think it would be yep Erica would be there too yep <laughs> so thank you very much so I'm gonna go ahead and introduce the item and then Erica and Fish will will take over so as we know, um, when we talk to our families, um, there are many times there are three things that are the most important for them. Um, the physical safety of their students, the health, of, the emotional safety of their students, and then also the academic success. And so we really do have a one-of-a-kind partnership through the nonprofit, through PVPSA. And so we're really fortunate to have them in many, many areas. Um, they provide not only our elementary students with the Kids Corner and the Valor program, which touches every single one of our very vulnerable high school students, um, but also they provide um, the Tupe, which is the tobacco um, education as well. And so, um, you know, when I first came here, I because it is a one of a kind partnership. I was uh, so excited to see the work that they have, and I will say that. Um, Erica never falls through for us. So when we have an issue with a, a death of a student or we have immigration or we have anything that's going on within the community, um, she's always a phone call away and um, supportive. And so Erica and Fish will say more about their program. There we go. Oh, I thought red meant off. No, it's the other way around. Uh, good evening, President Osmondson and Board of Trustees. My name is Erica, Watsonville High School alum, class of 94, do the math, I'm about to turn 45. Um, <laughs> and um, it has personally uh, uh, been a wonderful experience for me to be able to um, share my gifts and my talents to support um, the wonderful community that watched me grow and, um, and to do so in the school district that nurtured me and propelled me to go to Berkeley and then come back and give back. It's always full circle for me and I always like to share that because I think students need to understand that there are people that look like me that can definitely, right, uh, come back and give back. Um, this is Fish uh, uh, Williams, yes, yes. Fish. Uh, Fish. And <laughs> he, I have to say, is my left and right hand. Uh, he manages the operations uh, and the finances of our organization. And uh, this next calendar year marks our 30th year of partnership with PVUSD. Wow. 30 years. 30. So we need to have a celebration, don't we? We will, and we'll have a building to do it. Oh, exactly. Um, <laughs> exactly. So, so we, exactly. we do intend to come back um, in the fall uh, once we tabulate all of our information for the current fiscal year and provide you with a more in-depth presentation on what we were able to achieve this past year, um, some learning lessons. But I do wanna, before I jump into what we are proposing for the upcoming year, highlight some things that really preoccupied us this year, some of which you already spoke to earlier. Uh, clearly, this was a very um, interesting and different year in terms of the needs for trauma care and trauma management, particularly around anxiety um, and fear. Um, and so Dr. Rodriguez spoke about um, one of the early conferences that we had when, when there was a change in leadership, right, um, at, at the federal level. And what that has transpired to is, is just a more uh, increased awareness and understanding anxiety levels among children 
And what that means for us is that we get a lot more calls around this particular issue. We've been doing a lot of work with the rapid response teams in our community. Um, we don't tend to promote it a lot because um, we are interested in making sure people understand they can come to us and talk to us about those anxieties. Um, so when the rapid response teams out there um, find out that there's been a visit or a detention of someone, a loved one, they call us because they wanna make sure that we connect with the family to do some of that trauma care that needs to happen. Um, we've had some wonderful experiences in reconnecting families as a result of our uh, um, involvement early on where we were then able to work with our partners at, at CAB through SKIP uh, to get legal representation for the loved one that was removed. Um, and, and so, you know, it's amazing when you, <clears throat> when you hear stories like that. But I have to give kudos to my staff who is prepared. I am not a therapist by trade. Um, I am one of those crybabies. When they come and tell me all the stories, I, I tell myself, how? How do people do it? But I have a wonderful team of therapists that are trained. They're specialized in this particular field. Um, so that's preoccupied us a lot. The other issue is the issue of vaping. Um, uh, tobacco and nicotine um, has been a big focal point for our agency to such a degree that we've been able to expand the amount of education and soon policy work around this area. Um, of course, our building has preoccupied us as well. We were able to, um, this is a $3.6 million facility and I'm happy to report we've raised 3.2 million of the 3.6. So we're in the last leg of the race and um, we couldn't do this without the partnerships we have with PBUSD and so many other um, individuals and organizations. We also have been very intentional in expanding our services into Pajaro and Las Lomas. Um, and so we've been able to really work with Monterey County. We're also a, a mental health provider for the County of Monterey. We know that jurisdiction belongs to that county. So we've expanded the, the number of counselors that we're providing out there as well. Okay. And we're paying very close attention to the zero to five population in that community because there's a lot of zero to five children. Um, and we wanna make sure they're prepared emotionally to be able to enter this, the school, right? When it's time to, to do so. Um, and then also this year, um, we received requests from specific schools to provide specific services that we had in, in the past. So for example, at Watsonville High School, they really wanted to bring back the conflict resolution work. Um, so we were able to partner with them um, and provide a dedicated CRT counselor uh, for Watsonville High. It's been proven to be so successful that that is in fact one of the services they've asked us to come back, back to you to request for, yeah. for Watsonville High. New School is another um, uh, school site where we've been expanding what we are doing there. Um, the students at New School have wonderful strengths, but we need to wrap them with a lot of supports. So we are providing a dedicated mental health counselor at that school site um, who can provide care for all the students whether or not they have Medi-Cal. So um, the proposal before you really um, is not unlike the prior years, uh, noting that there are specific services that administrators at specific school sites have requested of us, um, and it's itemized in such a way. Our signature program um, that I uh, believe through the partnership with Student Services has um, been credited for reducing the number of, of expulsions. The Valor program continues to be a huge demand. Um, and it proves to be effective, right? Um, we don't want students to leave us, we want students to stay. They just need to have that individual that's reminding them and checking their grades and checking their attendance and talking to the family and saying, okay, what's going on? And assessing for mental health issues as well or substance abuse issues, which is what we do. No, I think that was yes. uh, five minutes. Yes. Oh, I'm done? So, <laughs> so yeah, thank you. So anyway, so the, the proposal before you uh, propose us to continue to provide the services that we have been providing, uh, the TUPE program is funded through the uh, California Department of Education. We've been a partner to write the grant with the district. So that's not really district funding, that's really state funding that we're able to leverage. And we do a lot of leveraging of Medi-Cal. So what you don't see in your proposal is over $3 million of additional funding that we're able to bring because of our ability to draw down those Medi-Cal dollars. Oh, and of course, first five, yes. And first five, yeah, I heard, I heard five. about that, I yeah. remember about that. <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, <laughs> 
but this what? <laughs> yeah. So quickly probably keep you up here. Is there comments from the board? Hmm? I just want to say thank you, Erika, for your passion, dedication, and love for our, our children, our city, and our district. And I'm glad to be sitting here and working with you, and I hope to see you in future meetings. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Jen. Just as one of, you know, one of the newer board members, it's been exciting to learn about this partnership. And uh, again, you know, echoing Trustee Dodge's comments, it's thank you for the work that you're doing for our community. Thank you. Um, I, you know, I, I wanted to ask you about some of your programs, but I guess I'm gonna wait till you do an, another thing about the programs, and then I'll ask you about, because there's a lot of questions I have about, you know, how they work, but I'll wait. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. Um, yeah, and I'm also so proud and so, I wanna express how I don't know how wonderful I think um, this program is, and and you have been so <laughs> incredible in terms of the leader of this program, mm -hmm. not only in terms of all the money that you've been able to get granted to us, but um, but but you know this, but you know just your ability to make things happen when they need to happen, you know, all over our community, and, and you know you were talking about. The whole issue of these children and uh, the trauma that they they you know that they have and 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 be able to figure out even how to get them back together again. Woo! That's pretty cool. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to say one of my favorite programs is the Valor program. I do. I do work with Watsonville Pell, and mm. it's it's just a wonderful program, and the kids really enjoy that program so thank you for making that possible thank you and for me i'm just really happy to see that we're expanding services to monterey county oh. i mean we do have a couple of schools mm -hmm. that are part of monterey but they still belong to pbusd so i'm really happy to hear about that i'm happy about the work that we're doing and always um, just a focus of, of on kids and their well-being you know i think that's something that we all share in common and so I do applaud you for the amazing work that you're doing. There's been so many good changes since you came aboard. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it, it's good to see that energy and that focus and um, yeah, just a purpose behind we, what we do. So thank you. thank you, it's been awesome. Oh, and I just want to add, yeah, the fact that you're over, my district is North Monterey County, obviously that's my district. <laughs> and <laughs> so, you know, I'm, over there all the time every school thing that's happening I'm over there and so the fact that I there's going to be more assistance to those people over there because it's really sort of a forgotten part of Monterey County if you will if you will it is they just said you know it's it's a forgotten area of Monterey County really definitely it is it's forgotten. <laughs> so the more work that we can do to benefit our children and our families in that section of Monterey, North Monterey County, the better, the better we're gonna be off, <laughs> we're gonna be, yeah, thanks. <laughs> I do have one question, and maybe you can speak to it, maybe okay. this is not the right time, but have you seen an increase in demand for services around um, marijuana use? So um, there's normalization that we're starting to see. Um, we work so hard at PVPSA to really spread the message of the dangers that happens when you uh, are underage and you ingest substances, whatever substance that may be. But what we are hearing from our staff, um, whether it be through the TUPA education program or the substance abuse services that we provide, there is an increase. And in fact, the California Healthy Kids Survey, if you compare over years, which I'll, I'll bring some data next time I come, come and, and share some programmatic info, um, the percentage of students that are normalizing uh, marijuana or cannabis has gone up, right? So usually we celebrate numbers going up. In this case, we don't like seeing that number go up, right? We actually want to instill um, a, a perception that there is danger around that. So what that means is um, 
uh, that we are hearing a lot more anecdotal stories. Of course, the data is all depending on the referrals that we get that are, are connected to uh, the substance being on a student. Um, when they were referred to us, we have seen an increase of uh, nicotine and tobacco related um, product on, on our students, but it's not um, to the degree where I would say, oh my gosh, it's a crisis, right? But we are starting to see it. And a lot of it has to do with the accessibility. If the accessibility to that product is available in our environment and in our neighborhoods and our community, there's a higher propensity for st students to get their hands on it, right? right. So this is where prevention uh, comes in and why we are so involved in policy discussions um, because those things do matter. Sorry, guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, there was, uh, you know, when the city of Watson approved the ordinance, uh, there was talk about, you know, the millions of dollars that that was going to bring uh, to the community. Have you seen any of those proceeds? Mm. No, <laughs> um, I, I would say, I think most of us read that even statewide, the projections um, no. that were once um, estimated have not mater materialized, right? And you hear about a lot of counties and cities struggling to balance their books because they, the projections were not. had revenues increase because of that, right? So from my experience of just working with Monterey County and Santa Cruz County and the respective jurisdictions, I haven't necessarily seen I was just going to ask one more question because I've been hearing a lot of news about San Francisco and other places trying to deal with, what are they called, electronic? E-cigarettes. E yeah, I don't even know. I don't, I have nothing to do with cigarettes practically. But so, yeah, the e-cigarettes kind of a thing and that they're thinking about in San Francisco prohibiting them somehow or they're, you know, there's a lot of issues about these because, you know, the, the, the they talked about them that they're better than cigarettes, but they found out that they're no, they're pretty toxic. Um, so, are you finding that is an issue with students now more than it has been? Or, or? what I can share is that there has been um, a conversation happening at the city, particularly with the chief of police, who um, will be working in partnership with the youth who belong to our Empower Watsonville program, a TUPA funded program, um, over the summer where they get to identify specific issues they want to work on, policy issues. Um, and I can tell you already that um, some of the Empower Watsonville kids that participated last year who are participating again, this is the one issue that they're going to be working with the chief of police on, on tackling for the city of Watsonville. I know e the county, e well, e-cigarettes, flavored nicotine, mm -hmm. the availability of that. Mm -hmm. So they're going to start that process this summer with the intention of taking something to the city council for approval in the fall. Okay. Um, so, so that is under works. Um, I'm not sure what the policy will be. I'm interested in having the board of trustees, those of you who may be interested, um, be informed and involved in that Yeah. Um, during the advocacy process. Uh, portion of, of the work that, that is entailed with that. So I certainly will inform Dr. Rodriguez so she can share that with you all. Thank you. Thank you. Karen, I have some questions. Okay. So I sit on the board and I, I was on it years ago and then joined again recently after the departure of Leslie DeRose. Yep. Um, but I do have some questions about the amount of this contract. So it's a kind of a weird situation since I sit on your board. It's a little bit of a conflict of interest, but I am, I am curious about a lot of these sums because over the years this has crept up. At one time I think the most we ever gave was 200000 Now we're close to three quarters of a million dollars. So mm -hmm. um, so have, have serv and you guys are bringing a lot more grants than you ever have so I'm just wondering why, why has the district share crept up like this? So we actually went back and we took a look at the last three years and I will tell you that when I came on board the the contract with the district was really at half a million dollars. Okay. Um, you may be thinking about the Kids Corner program or the Valor program that pretty much has stayed within the one hundred thousand dollar realm. Uh, the Kids Corner program has been pretty stagnant, but where you do see the variations, if you look back over the years, is the school specific programs, right? So the CRT, the New School. We didn't do much of that specialized service for schools. Now we are doing a lot more of that. There's also um, in your in your exhibit B there, you'll see 
um, CDE funded projects. So these are not necessarily district funded projects. These are like the TUPA work. All of that TUPA work comes directly from the state um, to do this kind of education and community engagement and um, the policy work that I, I, I reference. So that belongs to that. And then also, we have a very long stand standing partnership where sometimes we write grants and we fold district personnel into our grants so then the money comes back to you as well, right? Um, because that's really the, been the nature of our partnership from the very beginning. So uh, as an example, First Five, uh, the coordinator at the Pajaro Resource Center, that's fully funded through, through this grant and so we, we pay for that position um, for the district. So um, really, to answer your question, Trustee De Serpa, it's been these program specific, these school specific programs that have resulted in the increase over, over time. We didn't do much of that before. Okay, and then is some of, some of these awards, uh, are they a pass through, like the district somehow gets the money somewhere else and passes it through to you? Yes, so yeah. the TUPE for as far back as we could tell, um, has always been, it was like the signature program for PVPSA's creation, understanding that there's a lot of work that happens on the weekends, a lot of work that happens on, on in the evenings, during the summer, in the springtime with the youth. Um, of course, we also have um, certified staff that go in and do the tobacco and substance abuse education in the classrooms. So that is one where we partner to write the grant and it is a pass through. And then there is, it appears there's some returning of monies back to the district. Right. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, so when we write grants, and obviously it's going to require partnership with the school, if there is personnel on the school site that we know we're gonna need to, to fill or recruit, we'll work with HR and Dr. Rodriguez to identify, okay, well how can we make this happen? And then we're intentional in writing those positions into the grants so that um, that money comes back this way. And you know, so in the Pajaro Family Resource Center, as an example, it's critical to have that, that district employee in that center, right? It's a trusted center, it's got a lot of historical um, uh, respect in the community, people trust that space, and so uh, we fund that particular position for the district. So the position, this is a question for Kristen, I think, or maybe the superintendent. Um, the super the um, the mental health position at new school. Why wouldn't the district provide that as a credentialed person, like a counseling credentialed counselor? Like, why is that running through PVPSA? We actually have additional supports going into new school as well. So one of the things is that we found the need, though it's a smaller population, we have even greater need than that. Um, so the district is putting forward money in addition to to have dual parties so that every student is seen every week as well, so that there are touch-ins with both the parent as well. So this is essentially supplemental support for a really needy population of, of students. That, that we're trying to retain in Correct. school. Yeah, okay. And then the, the position at Watsonville Charter School for the Arts, can you talk about that? Yeah, that one came uh, at the request of the principal there. Mm -hmm who um, obviously because they're a charter school don't necessarily have the services and the supports built in for the students that need them. So they came to us and said, hey, we have a, a mix of students. Not everyone is on Medi-Cal. Some of the students have private pay and we know how hard it is if you're on private insurance and you're trying to find a therapist um, in the community. It's difficult. Um, so they came to us and said, if we do some sort of a, a hybrid model where you're able to leverage Medi-Cal, so um, when I come back and provide you with an overview of our programs, I'll talk a little bit abo about how we are able to leverage these millions of dollars, right, to that essentially go back into your school. Um, but in that situation, uh, the way it's spelled out, we acknowledge that a percentage of students are Medi-Cal, so we can leverage to cover the full pay of that position, and if a student doesn't have that form of coverage, we won't negate them for service, right? They'll sk still get the service. Just a reminder, this was a five minute discussion. We went over a couple of minutes. Thank you. Um, so the so it's not really a problem because I want all kids to have mental health for sure. Uh, I am a mental health professional, but when I see that Watsonville Charter School for the Arts has a full-time person being essentially funded by our district, when 
at our other schools, we don't have full-time people helping. Like in, in our middle schools, uh, I think, don't, aren't we 0.5s right now? Or did we add a full, an FTE this year? Yeah. So I will say, so a Watsonville Charter School of the Arts has their own funding source because they are, even though they're a dependent charter, they do have their own LCAP. And so um, their school population chose how they were to support that. Um, and so they do, they did decide how to utilize their, their personal resources. Um, and so they, that's how they chose to spend their funding as a school site. Okay. So in our junior highs right now, our middle schools, do we have an FTE counselor? We have a 0.5 for all of that population. We have a 0.5. And it, it's been dependent on the school as well. So we have had schools that have had greater need. So we have been able to look at sites that have additional need. We've increased days on, whereas others we may have drawn back. Uh, but yes, essentially across the, the board with middle schools, we have coverage there. Okay, thanks, Erica. I just want to make one other, um, not to go too in the weeds, but I think this whole issue of how are, how are we ensuring there's some equitable distribution of resource. One thing we do, and we have been doing with Suzanne, um, who I know just recently retired, during the summer, we lay out a huge matrix. We identify the social emotional counselors who's where, what days, and then we come in and we say, okay, this is how many certified BBS um, uh, uh, therapists we have, this is how many kids corner SAP folks we have, let's look at the map to make sure that we are covering our basis based on the need that we are seeing at the difference. So there is a, a method to how we, we place our staff to supplement and support when there are gaps, right? Because we just need to figure out how to do that. The other thing I will say is that um, I am happy to, to tell you, and I'll tell you more, that we're, I'm starting to work with Heather, and I know Kristen and I talk, to try to figure out how we can organize our system of delivery, because all of us provide similar services, but LBA for perhaps distinct populations, so that we can make sure we're being efficient and effective with every single dollar that we're spending in this social emotional work that we're doing and counseling work that we're doing. <laughs> okay, so one more, no more comments. Can I have a motion? Move approval. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 We were now at 601. I'm gonna abstain since I'm on the board. Oh, thanks. Okay, so it's 501 with one abstention. Okay, 9.5, approval of the 2019-220 school plan for student achievement called SPSA. And that will be, oh, it's not Michael Berman tonight, huh? I am pretending to be Michael Berman this evening. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Michael <laughs> Berman is um, at a conference um, and I, he asked if I would fill in for him okay. and I am happy to do so. Um, this evening, what you have are our updated school plans. Um, the acronym is, is affectionately referred to as SIPSA um, for the 1920 school year. Each school um, updates their SIPSA for the following year by having a needs assessment with their school community. The school site council is the primary group responsible for the um, development and, and revision of their school plans. And so they have gone through this process. Um, one of the kind of exciting things this year is that the state has a new template for the school plans um, that we have utilized this year that is completely aligned to the LCAP so that our school plans are now aligned to the LCAP um, and we can really have some targeted um, work going on there. And so uh, you have copies of each of the school's plans. They have been reviewed and Mike is presenting them for your approval. There's a lot of them to read, my goodness. <laughs> I, I literally think I, I read the board packet. I, was, I had like about four hours that I spent reading. <laughs> um, so there's no, no public comments. Okay, is there any board comments? I have one. Is, um, are this the socioeconomic information about the students listed in these school plans? Because I can see the, uh, I see a lot of other demographic information, but I don't see that. 
like how many on free and reduced lunch, essentially? That t number of students on free and reduced lunch, I don't believe is in the data that is provided in the school plan. No. I, I was funny because I noticed them all, you know, they looked pretty much the same, how they were put together and who the people they contacted and then, you know, the data, how they're doing and blah, blah, blah. But I noticed that when I went to Ohlone School, they didn't do that at all. They had a completely separate kind of thing that they did in Ohlone School. <laughs> so it was interesting. It's like, whoa, how come Ohlone School is so different? <laughs> Do you want to comment about that? <laughs> so when the, when the um, SIPSAs were due and all, they turned it in, we're reviewing them going through. Aloni mm -hmm. used um, a document that was in the past where she's in the process of, of correcting to put it on the new document, the oh. principal at Aloni. So getting them all through is going to be the same exact information, but in just a different format. Yeah, I mean, I kind of read it, and it sort of looked like I was kind of, see, but, you know, I mean, they having the data that shows their, you know, how well that they're doing, and each one of those things of there was the big one. I was like reading it, whoa, <laughs> different. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so um, is there any other board comments about all those t things that we read <laughs> from every school? Yeah, Jen. Just, you know, in reading through these, just recognizing the amount of work that went into, you know, and um, I just really appreciate having this as, you know, an action item. So we're paying, you know, particular, just an extra level of attention. And um, thank you for the opportunity to continue to really dive into those. Thank you. You're welcome. I will pass that on to Michael. Yeah, it was a lot to read. Any other comments? Kim, are you starting to make a comment? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Looks like you are. <laughs> Is there any room for like an executive summary of all of these? Because it's just a tremendous amount mm -hmm. of information to read, and not the, not all the schools are represented in the examples that were here. So it, it, is, it, yeah. is it even possible to tease out highlights or? Um, I th that is doable. I, I've I done that know. in I don't know. It's just past years. Because um, it's also very might difficult um, sure. Template. It's a lot of information. Yeah. Um, we may be able to work with Doc Tracking the the It's the online um, template that we use to pull together a small um, overview for each one. Um, and so you are aware. I'm I'm not sure if Michael put it in that um, the plans are all. Not only are they in the central database, but they're on the website as well, so that um, they are available for public review. Um, and they will be translated, but um, I will definitely pass on to Michael the suggestion of, of having a summary from each one. Thanks. Yeah, like I said, I, I took like f like four hours to read my board packet this time. Like, long time. <laughs> four hours is a long time. At least more than four hours, four and something. Um, okay, so can I have a motion? I move to approve. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Six, you're not going to, six zero one. <laughs> no abstentions. <laughs> okay. Um. <coughs> and we're going to, we're now going to do a board update on legal counsel services for PVUSD, and this is by Joe Dominga. All right, so this evening we have a short uh, PowerPoint presentation that we're pulling up right now, but as requested, uh, the board asked uh, for a summary and update on legal services that we contract out for, mm -hmm. and I just wanted to inform the board that um, we checked government code, and as a district, we are not required uh, to go out to bid for legal services and or any specialty services, which include financial, economic, accounting, and uh, ad general administrative services. And so the government code 53060 and 37103. Um, the other piece is that um, what districts are given the opportunity is making sure that the services are in alignment in the billing and that we're flexible on what, um, how those sources or resources are funded. And so those are the government code section for you to review. 
The key law firms that our district work with are Lozano Smith Attorneys at Law, and approximately uh, about 20 years uh, we've been with the firm as a district, and they handle human resource matters, board matters, student and parent matters. Uh, Fagman, Friedman, and Full Frost, uh, approximately 12 years, and that handles our SELPA special ed program. And then we have Dan as well over Kelly. Uh, we've been with them for approximately three years, and that handles our construction, purchasing and procurement, our bond, pro our facilities bond program, and then also Prop 39 charter appeals and charter uh, MOUs. So, Joe, before you continue, I just have a quick question on the slide. Yes. If I may. Yeah. Uh, who do we uh, use uh, for risk management? So risk management. So would that fall under? So under risk management, um, I'll have, there's a listing of firms. There's approximately 20 firms that we have, and I'll show it on the next, and what, two more slides. But we go through Keenan and Associates. Um, the major, these are the three major firms that we use for this, and then we have a whole panel of attorneys. Um, but for the three major firms, these uh, for 16, 17, 17, 18, and 18, 19, we broke it down of our expenditures uh, and the billing. And then we also provided one of the requests from the board was to list the average hourly rate for the attorneys. So we also listed that on the far right column. Um, as you can see for Lozano Smith in from 17, 18 to 18, 19, there was a decrease in uh, services and expenditures and the same for Fagman, Feedman, and Full Frost. Uh, Dennis Wallover Kelly, you see an increase, and you see that increase in 16, 17 to 17, 18, and that continuance. A major, majority of that was for PV uh, High School um, and the Pilots Association. That was the law firm that was representing the district and helping us in the settlement agreement, uh, the lease lease back delivery method, et cetera. So a lot of that is uh, assumed to that. And then also uh, Dennis Wallover Kelly is handling our procurement so we're implementing uh, procurement contracts with our vendors, and so we're implementing best practices. And so that's something they partnered up with uh, Richard in purchasing. And then we also have our bond council, Jones Hall. Um, and the reason you don't see billing for 1819 is because their billing is set b based on the bond issuance or the drawdown. So that's the last time you'll see with this bond program okay. because we've fully drawn down, so there would be no longer any future billing. And then on the bottom we have the total. So, um, so if you can go back, Joe, I'm sorry, I was trying to get Karen's <laughs> attention to get her um, to recognize me, but I just, so I wanted to note on two things. One, um, the reduction in Lozano Smith, you can see that it's highly reduced. Part of that is um, uh, is due to our benefit of having Dr. Chona Colleen be legal counsel herself. So she is able to, which I know she's no longer practicing, so that's why she's shaking her head. But because of that, we're doing a lot more in-house than we had previously where she's doing the work. And then I also want to recognize Heather Gorman for the strong reduction in the triple F. Um, and that is due to, um, as, we, as we noted, even in the agreement that happened um, tonight, that um, Heather is now taking on that when possible and doing it herself instead of having legal counsel um, be doing that work. So I just wanted to recognize the staff um, who has the skill set and the capacity to take on that work. So, um, Board Member uh, Orozco, this the, the legal panel listed here is through Keenan Associates, and this, these firms handle our workers' compensation. And so there's a variety of firms that specialize in workers' comp, and those are provided for all member districts within the uh, JPA through Keenan. And then we also have our segregation attorneys, which handle uh, property insurance. So if we have any insurance claims on our property or in legal, uh, we mean workers' comp. Uh, those are the two law firms that handle that type of work, and they specialize in that. And then there's the law firm that handles fraud. And so those are listed through our Keenan uh, legal panel. Uh, here we have our property and liability, and these are the firms that are under our Keenan Associates uh, coverage. And so those are the various firms that we also work with. And once again, just wanted to uh, reiterate uh, as far as the, our government code, our district is not required uh, to go out to bid or uh, RFP or a queue. And so we have that and we're following the government code. Um, implementing best practices, uh, recently um, 
and like to thank in partnership with finance and accounting, we've imp implemented electronic billing. Uh, so now we're able with our law firms to go through um, and uh, track our billing and our services and align that with the various departments. So now we've also aligned um, centralized to business services through my office to making sure that the various departments are charged accordingly. Um, so we're, uh, that was a huge accomplishment this last month, and so we're very proud of that. Uh, so those things have been completed, and we're moving forward. Thank you. I have a question. I, I do. Please. Um, when this was brought up, one of the questions was about legal counsel in with negotiations, and was that necessary, and or was that something we could eliminate the cost in um, with having not having Lozano and Smith in with negotiations? That was one of the questions that we had. So in, in particular situations, we have to have them present. So for example, when we went through both mediation and fact-finding, it was a requirement because they became our independent, um, the independent voice for us. I think what we have done, and, and Joan has done a good job of that, is when, when possible, we have tried to not have them in the room and have them in the room um, specifically when we're talking about um, contractual language, which we have to be very crisp on. Um, so we have done that. We do believe, and I would suggest to the board, that we continue to use legal counsel during certain situations of negotiations because we need to be very careful on um, being clear and crisp on the language. Much of the conflict that winds up coming up with um, with just the unit members is when we don't have clear and crisp language, it's interpretation. And when our true interpretations are not clear from the onset, that's generally when we have the most, diff the most challenge. So legal counsel often helps um, craft that language so that it's very clear and there's also um, just a, a good understanding of what is happening. Um, so we believe that a reduction is possible. Um, but I do want to know on Lozano and Smith, um, as you can see from the documents from 1819, um, we have not engaged, and that number is without engaging in legal counsel uh, or in negotiations. So we haven't been negotiating this year. Um, and so Lozano and Smith does help us with each and every one of our issues, um, both for staff discipline and also um, just regular general legal counsel. Yes, we we've had um, we have some we've had some negotiation sessions with PVFT this year, and Dr. Rodriguez is abs is right that we haven't um, engaged yet with CSEA, and um, we've been able we, we we have not had legal counsel um, president present at the negotiation sessions that we've had with PVFT, and we've had a number of uh, agreements that we TA like leaves, evaluations, etc. Um, because we have a good, hardworking team and, you know, absolutely fabulous leadership from uh, Dr. Rodriguez to be able to do that. Um, as we're going in negotiating um, more complicated um, articles, um, especially those that involve finance, we will definitely need, um, there'll be a, a greater need for legal counsel. But we've had sessions this year, multiple ones, where um, they were very positive, very collaborative, and we haven't had legal counsel present in those sessions. Uh, I'd like to point out too, um, I happen to be represented by SEIU, um, and I've had a lot of experience with um, negotiations both in this district and in the various jobs that I've held where I've been represented. And, mo and unions have attorneys too. Um, good ones. In fact, Pat Lerman, I don't know if anybody out there remembers Pat, but um, she was um, the counsel for the unions on the teacher side for many years, and she was very helpful to my family personally when we were going through a hard time um, in a different district. So it's not that just the district uses attorneys for negotiations. Also, unions have um, excellent um, attorneys um, giving them important counsel as well. So. Thank you. You're welcome.
I'm gonna, oh, and he's, now I'm gonna talk about, which is kind of cool, <laughs> the professional development for counselors, Kristen Schaus, that sounds great. I'm looking forward to it. Go for it. Good evening, board, Dr. Rodriguez. Uh, a few pieces, so we brought this item forward to kind of look at the baseline. There are a lot of needs with counselors. There's a lot of needs with our kids too. Uh, so no way a comprehensive view of everything that will be done in counseling or the continued efforts that we'll continue to move forward with, uh, but some highlights of kind of how we've anchored the work in the 2019-2020 school year and some of those highlight pieces uh, surround really looking at anchoring the work around the frameworks. Uh, so ASCA has put together, so the American School Counselors Association has put together a framework piece that looks at academic development, career development, and personal social development. I promise you the slides looked accurate when we uploaded them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's hard to look at. Uh, <laughs> uh, in terms of looking at what those national standards look like, so this has been a published framework uh, in specific to school counseling itself. It has each one of these sub areas has a domain and a competency indicator. So to give you an idea of pretty how comprehensive this framework piece would look like, this is one of those standards pieces. So within each one, you see a domain. In this case, it's career development. Then you see a standard associated with it, a competency, and then an indicator. There are several of these for each one of those domains. So kind of give you a, a brief rundown of at least what one of those would look like. Within this work, We've been working with uh, essentially four different pieces. So Hatching's results, uh, she's also the, not only co-creator of the Frameworks piece that launched, but she is also a co-author of using data to inform school counseling practices. So she does believe in data. The first thing that, that she says to all of our school counselors and us as we attend trainings is, let's really authenticate the work and figure out what work we need to be doing. Um, you'll see up there that the model that is used, and this is in combination with the county as well, includes counselors, the site and central office administrators. So that's a requirement of the work moving forward. And the idea obviously is the collaborative effort of making sure that we're all on the same page and all in on this moving forward. Uh, the goal of this piece, and we've gone through three sessions with her, uh, with county as well. So as you could imagine, our numbers of folks participating are higher than other districts because we have a lot more personnel involved. Uh, so we're kind of essentially creating the county scope of what this work looks like as well. So it's exciting for us to be able to be a part of helping other districts in this work as well. Uh, those main five parts that you look at are identifying the target areas of need, implementing and actually addressing those guidance activities that we use, measuring the results, so that'll come in a little bit later when we talk about synergy and its use, and then also looking at providing equity and access and improving our programs and our services. In addition, we have also anchored the work to the National Registry of Evidence-Based Programs and Practices. That is actually anchored by the U.S. Department Health and Human Services Division. Uh, so we are looking at what practices have been used in schools and which ones have high effect rates. Uh, CASEL as well, which is uh, working with social emotional learning. It's a collaborative piece. Uh, a lot of educators are involved in that piece and the piece that you don't see that's been cut off is Synergy. And that's looking at our own data and what that means to our students. So early warning indicators, uh, how we use our local information to really inform how our practices need to change. So 2019, 2020, some highlight pieces of things that we've seen. We do know that our kids struggle with suicide. We know that we have a lot of uh, mental health breaks at times and coping mechanism pieces. Uh, ASSIST has come out of the National Registry as well. It's applied suicide intervention skills and training. Uh, it's a five-day certification. So what you're gonna also start to see is the building capacity pieces of having folks trained and being able to bring in these certifications to our own district so that we're able to provide those services to more of our, our counselors as well. At this point, we'll have six trainer of trainers to be able to assist with the rest of our staff and as well with this training. Looks at essentially a, a five-day course that looks at the stigmas in relationship to suicide, what our adult behavior is involved with our students and how we talk about it. And also, what are those practical discussions? And when you do decide to have the conversations and what those look like, what you need to be ready for? Uh, because kids definitely will start to open up and have that conversation if they become more educated in it as well. You'll also see CASEL there. CASEL anchors a lot of the research and policy and communications that are going on with school districts in regards to social emotional health. 
Um, Sanford Harmony is a curriculum component that CASEL has recommended as well. That's targeting our elementary schools and it's focused really in a toolkit format that looks at those functions there that you see um, that you don't see. So I will uh, say them out loud for, <laughs> for the audience as well. So it looks at self-awareness, social awareness, self-management, and responsible decision making. Um, that also ties in fit uh, with a piece that we'll be talking about in regards to PBIS, that ownership of the behavior and those, those positive pieces that come out of elementary schools as well. Human trafficking, uh, probably one of the, the largest pieces that people do not know about in terms of how it impacts our schools. It's a $150 billion global industry. They call it a global industry because it matches what we used to see in, in slavery. Um, they refer to it as that because it impacts more families than folks think. You say human trafficking and folks go back to usually sexual exploitation of children and it's much more than that. So it looks at rapes, it looks at beatings, it looks at uh, these other functions of doing something for pay or coercion or fraud. Uh, so things like modeling agencies that hook their into our kids, nanny positions that aren't really nanny positions. There's a lot more to it than what folks think it is. Legislation passed uh, in 2018 in regards to making sure that not just our staff, but our students also receive information about healthy boundaries. What does that look like to keep healthy boundaries? That includes internet and other digital pieces as well. Uh, so the course pieces that we're looking at is 101 through 103. Uh, those also look at trauma informed. So it looks at what should we be looking for in reporting? How do we report? But it also looks at if that does happen, how do we support kids in that trauma lens? In terms of de-escalation, there's a, a few different options uh, with de-escalation. One that seems a little bit more solid with secondary that we're familiar with is, as well as elementary. So CPI and TCI are two of the, the most uh, used in school districts. Uh, one is focused on Crisis Prevention Institute. It has a little bit of a different lens on both, I will say, are strong in looking at what the triggers are, how to use nonverbals, how to bring kids down. The intent is never to go on hands-on, but there are times that you don't want a student to hurt themselves or other people. So how do you do that safely so that you don't risk staff or student harm in that? Uh, both of these programs do that and they do that very well. Um, so again, those pieces of be ready for something and what that looks like for, for our students. Facilitation of small group counseling. So what does it mean to actually have a purpose behind small group counseling? Pre-screening students to see if they're even ready to partake in that piece. And also planning. What is the curriculum that we're actually using? Uh, oftentimes we can get into groups with kids and not have an intent or a purpose and we're not prepared to how, to how to manage that and how to really move the topic or the questions that we're asking kids. So it's a skill that we are definitely looking at in terms of helping all of our counselors understand. Are kids ready to be part of that group? How do we get kids involved? How long should we keep them together? And what kind of questions do we ask? Uh, LGBTQ is looking at really the safety and the awareness of the issues involved. Uh, in addition, as you guys recall, as we went through the comprehensive school safety plans, this was an area that we highlighted as well that we can do a better job at. Uh, so how do we make sure that it's, it's not just inclusion, but that we allow and openly accept the students that we have um, and really draw out some of those issues to give them a community as well. And the last piece there, uh, also kind of chopped off at the end, was uh, positive uh, PBIS, positive behavior intervention systems. Uh, we are moving to the state conference. We'll have a large contingent at the state conference as well. Those folks coming back will also be those trainers on the campus. So when you're seeing folks go out, there is the intention and accountability to come back and train the sites and the staff that we're actually working with. So you're seeing that full circle of getting more bandwidth with the folks that do know the pieces that are moving forward. We're also looking at the tiered fidelity inventory. So that framework piece that really looks at what moves us from the levels of PBIS to really be solid with how we support our students and the restorative practices that we use on reentry. covered a small piece of what we're doing, but a lot of pieces that we're doing. So there are, our focus areas, you can imagine in the domains, if you were to think of the academic, social, emotional, and then the, the career, obviously you see a heavy lift on the social, emotional piece on this one, because that's what we're seeing our numbers and our data suggest that's what we need to spend the first part of our year looking at. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, so no public speaking. Okay, so board comments, Jen. 
Hi, and thank you for the work on this. So as we heard, you know, earlier, you know, in the meeting and through various points, where there, you know, obviously immigration uh, enforcement is a, a big concern right now. Um, my understanding is that there has been uh, training for our counselors, and so that's why we're not seeing that specifically addressed here. But can you talk about yes, that? Yes, that's bit? correct. There's also a piece that we will be doing a refresher piece with our administrators and our school office staff too. A lot of times, as, as Dr. Rodriguez mentioned as well. It's that piece of if, if we end up in a situation where folks go to a campus, what is our responsibility? Um, it is not the straight law enforcement piece of access to our kids. So those pieces are reaffirmed with our office staff themselves. The other piece that's highlighted within human trafficking as well is the exposure and the absence. One of the pieces of human trafficking is the threat of legal exposure. So families don't seek help. Families don't come out because they're fearful that they're going to be deported or moved. Um, so that is covered in the human trafficking piece as well because our families that are here are absolutely uh, more inclined to be victims of human traffic than, than other students that we have as well. And the next piece would be is that as we see or we see those pieces start to happen, as Erica has suggested, we'll continue to partner with them on messaging and make sure that our families have more information about what to do and what we can do. Yeah, Jennifer. I just want to say I'm happy to see the aspects of the social emotional learning because that's one of the big things that I have been interested in and in getting in our schools and implementing some kind of curriculum to really help our kids and hopefully prevent a lot of these problems that they have later as teenagers if we can start them off in, in kindergarten and first grade and really teach them about understanding themselves, understanding others, and the importance of respecting each other. So I'm excited to see that. Thank you. Thanks. I, I was just going to ask you, um, so those, for example, that are going to the PBIS conference, is there going to be a big, pretty big group to can come back and benefit? Um, yes. So right now what we're structured as is similar to when we did that, the PBIS kind of repush in terms of that, that number. I know you guys heard the information on it, but essentially we had over 50 people that were able to go to the last Northern California symposium piece. Yeah. We expect more than that. I'm going to hunch that we're probably going to be closer to 60. But the design really looks at an administrator in addition to the two lead members of each PBIS group. So what you basically have is that circle of accountability with the direct supervisor as well as the folks carrying out the work with our teachers as well. And and PBIS is now in every single one of our schools now, right? That correct? is correct. Because it wasn't at one point, it was getting there, but it wasn't there. That's correct. But it's everywhere now. It yeah. is. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> and growing. <laughs> and growing, that's good. <laughs> okay. Um, Just a quick question, comment maybe? Sure. Uh, <laughs> um, so this is exciting. Um, I'm assuming that cultural competence is somewhere integrated within the training. Yeah, um, Michael Berman, myself, and the rest of the team have been talking about what that looks like as well, so that when we do these trainings, it's not one shot on each side. It's that we're actually relevant on both sides. So the same educational piece that we're working through with the EL master plan and the cultural competencies there are seen in this work as well. Uh, right. So how do we make sure that you, there are different ways to approach folks of different cultures as well. So we have to be make sure, we have to make sure that we're aware of what that looks like as well. Very similar to the argument of when you have families that fear, you know, being deported in those pieces, there's a different approach that you have to use versus just picking up the phone and expecting them to come to the school. Right. So all of those pieces are being played out. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's really great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I always say you just turn me on the light. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> you don't ever ask me. But you I always look, try to look. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Karen, may I speak? No. Well, the, the light turned on. I know it's you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, about how many, so this is all about social emotional counselors. And I think this might be the very first time we've had a presentation about this. So this is great. And we've been able to add them with, um, with feedback from our stakeholders and LCAP and sites because for a long time we didn't have social emotional counselors. So this is really exciting. How many do we have all together? I know you gave us a whole roster last time. I did, I I'm looking at Lisa for I saved exact it. numbers. <laughs> we have, I can answer that question. Yep. We have five at the high school level, three at the middle school level, and four at the elementary level. That's great. 
there's I know you know I know you heard Erica talk as well the work that we're doing is looking at the alignment of who takes which piece of that tier and what the intensity of that work looks like so as you see the small group facilitation anger management conflict resolution those are things that we can have our social emotional counselors involved in so we're not actually hitting that top tier where we do need to outsource and get that that one-on-one -on -one piece through PVPSA as well so it's kind of aligning those folks and do any of our regular guidance counselors like overlap because I know they do a lot of occasionally um, emotional counseling when a student presents at their office and they're upset or whatever yeah our family outreach folks as well as your guidance counselors so when we go through the hatchings work that work is actually done with all of our counselors so you're quote unquote and, and they do have the same credentials but quote unquote our academic counselor folks are with their them as well so they're getting cross trained in all of these pieces that's great um, and then I'm wondering if we could bring back on a different um, presentation that's a lot like this like the training that our um, guidance counselors are getting sure because there's been holes and problems and turnover and kids losing a lot of scholarship money as a result of bad advice or no advice so I, I would like, I think we're all very interested in that never happening again in our district. Um, so I, I would like a presentation like this based on the guidance piece too. So the academic domain. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, this is great though. Thank Thanks. you. I just want to say thank you, Kirsten. I know you've been doing a lot of work and I know the guidance counselors have been doing a lot of work. I uh, attended. Um, there was there was like a conference by my house a couple months mm -hmm. back at the church and there's a people are excited about this and they're trying to do more they're, they're working to do more and thank you for putting this together thank you thank you <laughs> okay so we're in the very end of our session for the consent agenda. No public speakers. Um, I wanted to accept with gratitude the donation from Monterey Peninsula Foundation for Watsonville High School grad night. <laughs> so thank you so much for that. <laughs> Okay, can I have a motion? Yeah, you, you, that, um, this is, do the motion first and then we'll defer the item. No, I mean, no, 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 make a motion for the consent agenda and then we'll defer. Yeah, that's how it goes. Yeah, that's what it is. Yes. I might, yeah, I might too. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we okay, so you made a motion, right, Jennifer? No, she, not yet. So I would I would like to also pull the community foundation grant. So that's item 11.3. Which one do you want to pull, Jen? 11.3. Okay. So I'll, I'll make a motion, actually. I'm pulling 11.3, 11.11, and 11.14. 14. 14. Mm -hmm. Second the motion. And then I was going to pull one, too. Um, I'll amend my motion. Which yeah. one do you want to pull? I'm going to put 11.16. Just ask her a question about the tr Building Trains Council training education. Okay. And also pulling 11.16. Will you amend? Yes. Okay. First and second. All right. <laughs> all, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Let's start with the deference. So, so we'll start with the lowest one, the 11.3. So um, so all of our high schools, including Renaissance and New School and all comprehensives, were eligible to receive a grad night grant from the Monterey Peninsula Foundation. I've said this multiple times. So is, 
is that something our grant writers should have been responsible for helping to to pull those down or is that something the activities director at each school should do because it really would have offset the costs the very expensive costs of those grad nights for a lot of the students so we did present the information to the to the school sites and it was their responsibility to move that forward. Um, most of them, that would have been taken on by the athletic director or the activities director. Um, how it could, however, it could have also have been like a vice principal or the principal as well. Um, we, it, what we do is we have our grant writer work on um, significant grants that pull in large amounts of funding for the site or for the sites in the district and the littler grants, um, we do have her push off to the sites because otherwise she would be taking up her time doing little grants and not able to do yeah, um, the sense. large grants that we've been pushing forward. So you're saying the, this, just the other places just didn't do it. They just bo didn't bother. They chose not to, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, now Jennifer. Okay, so my first. Oh, we both. Well, I make a motion. Yeah. I'm sorry. I make a motion to approve 11.3. I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> so okay. you have to do this one at a time. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so mine, um, we're just going to go in order because um, yours is 11.16, right? Yeah, okay. mine's 11. Um, 11.11, .11, approve agreement for architectural services for assessment and schematic design of the towers building. So my concern is with our budget as it is, what exactly are you guys trying to accomplish with the towers going forward here? So, so, go ahead. so one of the items that we uh, as the board approved um, when we got the financing to acquire the property, uh, the, the building and the property, we set aside approximately close to six million for deferred maintenance uh, projects, but also to uh, complete any upgrades to the building that we sought uh, were needed. And we did an assessment of the buildings, both buildings, and there were some internal findings. Uh, some included the sections of the roof, HVAC. Uh, another section was a reception area um, located on the first floor. And so kind of more of the logistics uh, planning of that piece. Um, and then another uh, finding was the lack of, or the amount of entrance points into the building. I believe it was about, and Rich helped me, I believe it was 24, approximately 24 entry points to the buildings. Um, and this was an issue and a concern because of, of safety for district staff, but also for parents and community members. It's confusing if you don't enter through the main entrance, um, you get lost really easy. Um, so that was also uh, recognized and other items, um, the condition or age of the um, interior of the building. So this uh, architectural agreement is to look specifically at a reception area and main entrance point and then also to review our security um, enhancement. Um, so what we're looking at is a main entrance point to the building and enhancing security services, whether that's a keypad or a fob to enter into the building uh, so that we can designate uh, what um, entrance points are locked down. And the other uh, request from the board um, was to look at our student services in an enrollment center, a parent engagement center, which was an area that we do not have. Um, so currently our parents and families go up to the third floor uh, for various services. So what would that look like if we had that on the first floor as an entry point? So it's more accessible for enrollment packets or um, questions regarding services as the district as a whole. So that's uh, also included in this agreement. And um, I believe that covers all of it. One more uh, here. Also, it was the seismic retrofitting. So part of the analysis that when we went through was that the building was, um, was safe for life and limb. However, it would, if there was a major earthquake, there would be significant damage to the building. So part of the reason why it was such a large amount that had to be set aside um, was due to the fact that we also have to do retrofittings of the inner beams. Um, and so that's another large portion of the funds. So when people saw this, there were some that thought that we were going to be making this a spanky new place. Um, and unfortunately, that's not the case. 
It's really just um, making sure that we have a roof that doesn't leak, that we have air conditioning and heating so that we don't have people using individual heaters, um, and then um, making sure that um, this the building is safe and secure and that parents, when they come in, um, that they actually are well received and feel valued. Okay, so this is for the first phase of getting the initial estimates and everything going. And so we've already put aside $6 million for that, and that's already in the Correct. budget. Yes. Okay. Yes. I just so want to clarify those points. And then the, the budget too. is not the general fund or any of the our adopted budget. It's within the financing, financing that we got for the property acquisition. Okay. So it's built into the that schedule that we shared uh, when we acquired the property. Thank you. I think it's an important point for the public to know too. Thank you. You're welcome. And if I can add, I think one of the things that as a board we're really excited about is that. Um, resource center per se where, where um, parents can just come in it will be a one stop for every information that they need access at that point in time and I don't think currently we we have anything like it so no. I think it's always hard for parents to navigate and know who to go to to receive services or um, enrollment packets and so forth so I think having a centralized place where it's safe and it's welcoming I think will benefit yeah, I see accessible will be uh, dev definitely a, a benefit to um, our parents and families. Yes, absolutely. So with that, I would like to make a motion to approve this item. Can I just make a quick comment? Um, I wasn't here when a lot of this, when the towers was bought, but you know, I'm go ahead and support. But I just wanted to bring up a concern. One of the first things that I said when I came to talk to Michelle was Coralitos Creek floods. We're in a flood zone, and I just want us to be aware that we're next to a creek. We're in a world lower elevation. You can look when you park right here at the parking lot. If you look right across the creek, it's higher and we're lower. Um, I just want to, I know Nancy knows about that. You know, the, we flood, we're in a flood zone and floodplain, and I just wanted to reiterate that. Thank you. Aye. The next one was 11.14. Um, that's the Pajaro Valley Playfields project. Um, I think we're enduring it and or incurring an additional cost, I believe, with this. Can you explain a little bit about that? So this one is uh, actually a uh, district requested, and it was strategic. Mm -hmm. um, there's two portables. Um, that are near the um, the gymnasium. That currently the site does not have an adequate space. Um, they're using a regular size classroom. The easiest way to explain this uh, for a music room. And so what we're doing is we're um, uh, demolishing a wall for two adjacent portables to make a larger music room. And then we are also looking at some acoustical type um, um, frames uh, to install on the wall. So it could be, it could fit the purpose of the music program. Uh, but currently right now they only have a, a one single classroom portable for the music room. And so this is expanding that classroom to join two classrooms together. Um, and the option, and I think the site's very pleased with that, uh, because as the auditorium um, is down the road, it's also we can be functioning as a school site and having the music program continue. And so um, one of the cost savings measures that when we met with the contractor, um, and that's why we wanted to go out uh, through this process is because if we would have stopped or brought in another uh, contractor or stopped the work and after this project was done, the cost would have increased significantly. So since the contractor was on site, we agreed to have it as a change order so that we can accomplish that. And it's part of the scope of the project. Um, the other piece that was also had a, uh, an impact of this was the portables that were uh, near the football field that had to be demolished. Um, so because of that, that also uh, assisted us in kind of linking these two portables together. You're welcome. Question. So Joe, uh, d won't, um, won't the music program practice in the Performing Arts Center? Won't they have space there to have so their instruments and have a pit? And Yes, okay. so the auditorium currently, the way it's designed, has a stage, auditorium, practice room, a green room, and storage. Uh, we might need more than one music room because we might have multiple music things. Right, happening. and the program's actually in effect now, mm -hmm. and Matt's doing a great job in building it. 
And so how do we serve our kids now? And so this is the fix to serve them now. And once the auditorium is built, now it, uh, the site will have an, uh, more options. Do they use this as a practice room? Do they use this as a more career tech ed room uh, once the auditorium's uh, completed? So it does Great. benefit now. Thank you. You're welcome. So just, just really quick, one thing that was going to happen if we didn't do this was we were going to have to reduce the VAPA programming just because now we have more students coming in. There also was an issue with the Cusco level that it actually was at the damaging level um, for the amount of decibels and with the number of instruments in the room. And so that's why um, not only was it for the growing of the program, but it was also for the health of the students. We weren't going to be able to grow to a full size band or even close to that um, with just one room. So we needed to split it and then put the acoustics in there so that the decibel level um, would not get up too high. Move approval. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Is this 11.16? 11.16, okay. Yes, this is, um, we're pretty excited about this because this fulfills one of the seven parts of our um, areas that we are supposed to cover and one is pre-apprenticeships. And we're going to be working with the um, building trades and we're going to offer um, five trades, carpentry, mason, masonry, um, plumbing, electrical, and the HVAC. So we're, um, we're looking forward to finding people that want to do this, become pre-apprentices, and we have found that even if they don't become an actual apprentice, they end up with jobs because they have these skills. So we're looking forward to it. It's a, it's a good, um, it's a good thing for our students and something good for our school. So the union is just coming out and saying that well, they're gonna do They're involved. It's gonna be fully involved. Are they gonna give the education? No, they're gonna do the yeah, they're, they're the building trades. They're going to be involved in helping us teach the whole component. There's a sp specific curriculum, the whole thing. They're going to do the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Wow, so cool. That's <laughs> great. All right, so let's I'll, have a motion. I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. So motion number one, closed session item 2.1. I move to approve the certificated personal report as presented by district administration on June 26, 2019 with 393 and 12 additional action items, including one correction. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion number two, closed session item 2.2. I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by district administration on June 26, 2019 with 221 and one additional action items. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Announcement number one. The Pajaro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Daniel Jacobs Meyer as a new coordinator of site academics at Mar Vista Elementary School. Mr. Jacobs Meyer has been serving the students of the Pajaro Valley since 2005 as an elementary teacher, tech liaison PBIS team member, and tech cadre participant. Mr. Jacobs Meyer is trained in the Mindful Schools curriculum, integrated a variety of technological tools to gain a deeper level of learning and engagement, and builds class communities to facilitate social emotional development. He obtained his Bachelor's of Arts in US History from UCSC, his multiple subject teaching credential from CSUMB, and his administrative services credential from Concordia University. We are proud to welcome this highly accomplished educator to his new administrative role. Announcement number two. The Pajaro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Aaron Langoreta as a new coordinator of site academics at MSD Elementary. Mrs. Langoreta has been serving students of Pajaro Valley since 2007 as an elementary school at Ohlone 
Elementary and spent the past 10 years at Vanticliff Elementary. She received her administrative service credential from the Santa Clara Co County Office of Education, multiple subject teaching credential and degree in liberal studies from San Francisco State University. Mrs. Leigh Gareda has been serving as a fourth and fifth grade teacher at Radcliffe. In this role, she has advised many student teachers from UCSC, participated in the Cots and Art of Teaching Foundation, tech liaison, member of site leadership team, and planned and organized many fundraisers to help send students to outdoor science school. We are proud to welcome this highly accomplished educator to her new administrative role. Announcement number three. The Pajaro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Rob Hoffman as the new assistant principal in split assignment with Watson High and PB High School to assist with after school and intervention program. Mr. Hoffman has been serving students in the Pajaro Valley since 2009 as a biology integrated science teacher. He has served as K through 12 science curriculum coach and career technical education coordinator for our district. Mr. Hoffman received his administrative service credential and master's degree in educational leadership from San Jose State and a bachelor's degree in biological sciences and teaching credentials from Cal State Chico. Among his achievements and, and grants are National Science Foundation RPP co-principal investigator, computer science, Santa Cruz County Science Lead Steering Committee, Environmental Literacy Initiative, Panama Canal Project, Partners for International Research and Education, Teacher Cohort 21st Century Technology Classroom Grant, Lead Teacher and Pacific Coast Teacher Innovate Innovation Network Grant. We are proud to welcome this accomplished educator to a new administrative role, and all these were passed 601. Thank you very much. So the last thing I wanted to report out is the final settlement agreement and release for one special education student. And oh, the, the, okay, past 601, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, then um, I'm gonna close the meeting and our next meeting will be July 10th here.